Militant feminist Jodi Allard is back at it. After writing a piece essentially calling her sons complicit in rape culture, after I offered one of her sons an internship, by the way, he sent a resume, uh, he withdrew it late last week for an internship for unspecified reasons. Allard has now written a follow-up attempting to explain herself. She wants to explain why writing nasty things about her children is not quote-unquote abusive. First, she explains, people are misinterpreting the terms rape culture and toxic masculinity. She doesn't mean that all men are potential rapists. She only means that society promulgates the belief that women are to blame for sexual violence and misogyny, while normalizing sexual violence and aggression. She also says toxic masculinity, it only means that society has visions of masculinity that are toxic. Yes, that is much better, Jody. I'm sure your sons will be very, very grateful for your clarification. Then she moves on to her explanation about why she would invoke her own sons in attacking these pernicious structures. Here's what she writes, quote, with those definitions out of the way, it should be clear that discussing how particular men, even my children, absorb these cultural ideas is in no way abusing them. Well, she did a little bit more than that. Her original piece said this about her own sons, quote, I don't feel emotionally safe with them, and perhaps never have with a man, but it needs to be said, because far too often we are afraid to say it. Those little boys grow into men who know the value of women, the value that's been ascribed to us by a broken system, and it seeps out from them in a million tiny, toxic ways. According to Allard, though, she's just educating her kids in the pages of the nation's largest newspapers. She said, I encourage my sons to reflect on their own cultural indoctrination into racism, sexism, ableism, etc., without shame. Without shame? In the pages of the Washington Post, she wrote, direct quote, my sons are part of the problem. <laughs> that is not education. That is public shaming. She then reiterates her central contention that men always make women feel emotionally unsafe, which is kind of weird given the functioning relationships between billions of men and women in the history of the planet. But Allard contends, quote, the heartbreaking part is that even good men can't be fully or completely safe for women, even when they're our own flesh and blood. She concludes, quote, there's no doubt that writing about this journey opens my family up to examination and criticism. However, it's a bit absurd to suggest that my sons are the ones bearing the burden, except that they are, which is presumably why one of her sons sent me a resume, even if he later withdrew from consideration. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. So many things to get to today. Weird things happening right before the show that we will have to discuss on air to the detriment of one of the new producers over here, a fellow named Marshall. Um, but we'll discuss all of that in just a few moments. First, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Ring. So, Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer. The summertime is when a lot of home burglaries actually go up because people are out of the house for longer periods of time. Uh, and what they usually do, burglars are very often, what they do is they ring the front doorbell, and then if some, nobody answers, they assume nobody's home, they break in. What Ring allows you to do, it's a video doorbell, so when you they ring, it pops up on your phone, you can see their face, you can talk to them, you can act like you're at home so they don't rob your house. Uh, also, they have this amazing new floodlight cam, which extends the security to the rest of your room, your, your home, rather. It's a floodlight cam motion activated camera it connects right to your phone with hd video two-way audio letting you know the moment anyone sets foot on your property you can see and speak to visitors even set off an alarm right from your phone and with that floodlight cam when things go bump in the night you'll immediately know what it is and who it is ring floodlight offers the ultimate in-home security with high visibility floodlights and that powerful hd camera with ring you are always home save up to 150 dollars off a ring of security kit when you go to ring.com slash ben ring.com slash ben Again, everybody is getting it in the LA area. We had a handyman come over the other day and he said, you know, do you already have Ring? I said, yeah. He said, if you hadn't, that's my number one seller right now, ring.com slash Ben. Uh, and he, and it, it makes your home completely safe. For people like me, I'm, I'm very paranoid about security because I have two little kids in the home. Uh, it makes me feel safe, particularly when I'm on the road because I can even pick this up if I'm in New York or something. So nobody knows that I'm not at home. Okay, so I want to get to the Mooch. This is, this is Scaramucci. Anthony Scaramucci is the new press head, head of press. Uh, over at the Trump administration. He probably will end up as chief of staff because Trump looks like he's getting ready to clear house. I've heard from Marshall that he is very hot right now, or he's hot or something. Uh, I don't understand. I don't understand what in the world that was. This morning, Marshall, who is new here, uh, turns to me and says, Mooch is hot, right? And I was like, what? Just what now? What? What? Did you, what? Hmm? What? I regret nothing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, Marshall. I'm glad you regret nothing. You might when your paycheck fails to come next week. In any case, uh, we'll get to Scaramucci at the White House uh, in just a moment because it does say something about where the, where the Trump administration is and where they are going. There's a lot of turnover. I also want to get to Jared Kushner because Jared Kushner finally put out an 11-page statement. Uh, he's supposed to give it before Congress today. He's supposed to testify. And it really does give the lie to a lie. If what he's saying is true, then the media have been fibbing this whole time, which would not be a tremendous shock. But I want to start today 
with the situation over in Israel. So over in Israel, uh, there has been been riots. Uh, There was a a situation over the weekend in which an evil 20-year-old Palestinian Arab went into a Jewish home, broke into a Jewish home. There were a bunch of five kids at home, I think, uh, and uh, they were celebrating the birth of a newborn. They're having what's called a Shalom Zahor, which is a a celebration that you have when there's a newborn baby boy, uh, and people were over. And uh, after that, it was late at night, and uh, the, the grandparents and the parents were sitting in and talking, and this Palestinian Arab broke into the house and stabbed to death all three, uh, three of the four people. The, other, the fourth person was stabbed as well, so three people were murdered in their own home. Uh, here's a picture of the floor so people should see what this looks like. Um, it's just horrifying. I mean, that's, that is the, the family's blood all over the floor. Uh, the Palestinian Arab was shot to death by an off-duty soldier who came running from next door. The reason that all of this happened, why did all of this happen? This happened because there are two Pal- three Palestinians who invaded the Temple Mount with guns, shot two Israeli Druze police officers. They weren't Jewish, they were Druze, which is a different religion, and, uh, and killed them. This was last week. And Israel, in response, said, hey, we're going to put some metal detectors by the entrance to the Temple Mount. That's what we're going to do. Okay, now we have metal detectors here in the United States everywhere, right? We have them at the airport. We have them at ball games. We have them at some offices. We have them at public schools now. Have you ever heard of a riot over a metal detector? Well, Palestinians decided it was very important to riot over the metal detectors. Here's a poster of, of what they were, what were saying. And you can see that they are cheering uh, the, the so-called uprising. Hours before that murderous attack, Fatah encouraged Palestinians. Fatah, by the way, is the military arm of the Palestinian Authority to rage and called for escalation and glorified death. It says, if I fall, I will not be the first to die and not the last to die. Hashtag rage, hashtag Friday of dignity. This is the Palestinian government, okay? This is not a terrorist group. This is the Palestinian government military arm. And so when people say that Israel has a peace partner, that is absolute, absolute horse crap. It is not true at all. You want to see Israel's Palestinian peace partner? Here is the mother of the 20-year-old who murdered a family uh, for no reason other than because he had been whipped up to rage by his own government over the installation of metal detectors at a holy site that Israel allows Muslims to keep control of for no apparent reason. Here's the mother. Praise Allah. I am proud of my son. May Allah be pleased with him. Okay, so she's praising her son who was killed in a terrorist attack after murdering three innocent people. Just horrific all the way around and should be demonstrative of the fact that when it comes to this so-called cycle of violence, there's only one side that wants to engage in random violence and cheers it. Okay, the government of the Palestinians cheers this stuff. There is no moral equivalence here. Anybody who says there is is lying to you. You're looking at the face of evil right here. Her son is an evil person and the Palestinian government is evil as well. It is just horrifying uh, on every level. Okay, so. In other news, uh, back in the United States, the, the important news of the day is that Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, is uh, supposed to speak today before congressional committees. And his testimony explains all of his contacts with various Russian government-connected sources over the course of the campaign and the transition. And it's very plausible. I mean, honestly, when I read it, I believe it. If uh, absent extra evidence, a- absent external evidence of, of malfeasance or bad action, I'm not seeing anything here that suggests to me anything nefarious between Kushner and the Russian government, for example. Now, there are apparently some financial relationships between the Trump organization uh, and Russian government sources. I'll talk about that in a second. But Kushner's full-scale summary of what exactly happened here is worth going through because the media is, is giving you the headline, but they're not giving you the truth. The media, as always, is exaggerating the Russia stuff. So what the, the media headlines today say things like, Kushner took four Russia meetings, says no collusion. Okay, but that's not the, de- that's not the full explanation. I mean, the reality is that what he says is that these meetings were basically big nothing. So, for example, he says, when it became apparent that my father-in-law was going to be the Republican nominee for president, as normally happens, a number of officials from foreign countries attempted to reach out to the campaign. My father-in-law asked me to be a point of contact with these foreign countries. These were not contacts I had initiated, but over the course of the campaign, I had incoming contacts with people from approximately 15 countries. His first meeting with Russia or Russian representatives during the campaign occurred in April 2016 at the Mayflower Hotel. This is the same meeting where apparently Jeff Sessions met the Russian ambassador. He said, Kushner said he met four ambassadors, including Sergei Kislyak. We shook hands, exchanged brief, brief pleasantries, and I thanked them for attending the event. He said this lasted less than a minute. Okay, that was the source of a number of headlines over the course of the last few months. Then there was a report from Reuters that he'd done a couple of phone calls with Kislyak. He says, we checked all of our phone records. I have no information about this. I even asked Reuters what the dates were so I could check it. I don't remember this happening, and I have no evidence of it happening. Then 
there is the second meeting with the Russians, okay? So the second meeting with the Russians was the infamous Donald Trump Jr. meeting. That was the one where every Russian in the Western Hemisphere came to this meeting, uh, and that was the one where Donald Trump Jr. said that he was gonna, that he was hopeful that there would be information about Hillary Clinton from the Russian government. But Kushner says, I had no idea what this was. It was listed in my calendar as Don Jr. meeting. I went there. It was a big nothing. They were talking about adoption by the time I got there. And I even wrote my assistant an email that said, can you please call me on my cell? Need excuse to get out of meeting. So he thought it was enough of a waste of time that he faked a phone call to get out of the meeting, which is something that I do pretty much every day here at the Daily Wire. And then finally, uh, he, he says that there was a third contact from a rando emailer that meant nothing, and he reported to Secret Service. Then there was a meeting on December 1st at Trump Tower with Kis Kislyak and Michael Flynn. And this is the one that a lot of people are circulating around. At that meeting, Kislyak said he wanted to address U.S. policy in Syria and that he wanted to convey information from what he called his generals. Kislyak told Kushner the generals couldn't make it over to the United States and wanted to use a secure line in the transition office. Kushner said there was none and asked if they had an existing communications channel at the embassy we could use where they would be comfortable transmitting the information they wanted to relay to General Flynn. So as you recall, there was a big story about how Kushner wanted to set up a secret back channel to talk with the Russians from the Russian embassy. And it was such a weird suggestion that even the Russians were taken aback by it. Well, apparently what this basically is, it sounds like Kushner is just an idiot, right? Kushner said, they said to him, do you have a secure line? He said, no, do you have a secure line? And that was the extent of the conversation. And so does that sound like something nefarious? No, it doesn't. And then finally, December 13th, Kushner said he met with a person named Sergei Gorkov, who said he was a banker at the request of Kislyak. Here's Kushner's account of the meeting. The meeting with Mr. Gorkov lasted 20 to 25 minutes. He introduced himself and gave me two gifts. One was a piece of art from Nivgrad, the village where my grandparents were from in Belarus, and the other was a bag of dirt from that same village, which is an awesome gift. I've tried it with my wife. I just go out to the garden, get a garbage bag, put some dirt in it. I'm like, happy anniversary, sweetheart. Any notion that I tried to conceal this meeting or that I took it thinking it was in my capacity as a businessman is false. In fact, I gave my assistant these gifts to formally register them with the transition office. That's got to be fun. You walk in with the transition officer, like one bag of dirt. Okay, so after that, he told me a little about his bank and made some statements about the Russian economy. He said he was friendly with Putin, expressed disappointment with U.S.-Russia relations under Obama, and hopes for a better relationship in the future. There were no specific policies involved, and no time was there any discussion about my company's business transactions, real estate projects, loans, banking arrangements, or any private business of any kind. At the end of the short meeting, we thanked each other, and I went on to other meetings. Uh, it's interesting here, the, the one thing he doesn't say uh, is that there was no talk about Trump's investments because Gorkov leads up a bank called VEB, which is a Russian bank under scrutiny by U.S. investigators that financed a deal, this is according to the Wall Street Journal, that financed a deal involving Trump's one-time partner in a Toronto hotel tower at a key moment for the project. So the Gorkov, uh, of all the meetings, the Gorkov one is the most suspicious, but none of them is enough to really raise tremendous hackles at this point, absent any sort of outside information, which suggests that the media have been blowing everything out of proportion. Now, the big question here is why Kushner didn't just come out and say this a while ago, right? I mean, if it's so innocent, then why wouldn't Kushner just come out and spill this, right? All these stories came out months ago. He could have just said, that meeting with Kislyak, here's what I said. Not a big deal. Calm down. Instead, they let this simmer and, and rage for months at a time. And again, there's been, there have been too many updates uh, in, in the recent past about things that Trump and his team have said for us to take everything at face value. But this is a very plausible story. I don't see anything here that looks suspicious. And again, there's no evidence that Kushner, at least, was colluding with the Russians. Meanwhile, President Trump is feeling more and more under siege, and you can see that. He's very angry because he feels like people are not defending him enough. Now, it's hard to defend the president and his son after his son says things to the Russian government like, I love it, in an email exchange in which they offer support to him. It's hard to defend Trump from that. It's hard to defend Trump when Trump care falls through. I mean, these are things that are hard to defend. It's hard to defend him on Syrian policy. I'm happy to defend him where I think he's doing the right thing or where I think that the media have been lying about him. So that's why I'm defending him on the Kushner stuff, because I see no evidence that Kushner is lying. And so the media's attempt to play that as Kushner is some sort of nefarious Russian source, I think is a bunch of nonsense. That's not stopping Trump, though. Uh, he's tweeting out how he feels really under attack. I don't like the whiny stuff from the president. He's the most powerful man on earth. He has a bully pulpit at his disposal that no person in the history of mankind has had. Uh, and, uh, and yet he's treating this as though he's a victim. He says, as the phony Russian witch hunt continues, two groups are laughing at this excuse for a lost election taking hold. Democrats and Russians. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, that doesn't bother me. This is the part that bothers me. He says, it's very sad that Republicans, even some that were carried over the line on my back, do very little to protect their president. Okay, first of all, the idea that he, that it is Republicans' job to, quote-unquote, protect the president 
when it is his job to tell the truth about things does not seem to me correct. Also, this idea that Trump carried people over the line. There's legitimately maybe one guy in the United States he carried over the line electorally, maybe Roy Blunt in Missouri. Every other race, Trump ran behind Senate candidates and congressional candidates. In fact, Trump was a drag on the ticket a little bit. That's just the statistical fact. So this idea that everybody should be very grateful to him for their jobs is just not true. And again, it's whiny. Like, if you have something that you want to say, just say it. He says, it's hard to read the failing New York Times or the Amazon Washington Post because every story opinion, even if it should be positive, is bad. Again, I agree with all this stuff, but it's getting boring at this point. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the fact is that all these newspapers have always been against Republicans. And finally, he says, if Republicans don't repeal and replace the disastrous Obamacare, the repercussions will be far greater than any of them understand. Yeah, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what the repercussions are supposed to be, and he hasn't proposed a plan. So, again, Mr. President, please buckle down to business and stop with the world's tiniest violin routine. It, one of the things that I said when they appointed a special prosecutor on all this Russia stuff is, now would be a good time to shut up. Just stop. Just stop talking, right? Now would be a perfect time for you to sit back, let the investigation take place. You can say, listen, it's moving forward. I'm not at liberty to discuss it. Nobody's at liberty to discuss it. He's doing what he's going to do. It'll be what it's going to be. End of story. Instead, it continues to foment, and it continues to foment because Trump insists on doing stuff like this. For people who think that this is the sort of fighting back that we need, let me just ask why this is productive. Like, his base, I understand, is very enthusiastic about all of this, but I don't understand why this is productive in forwarding his point of view. Like, we all understand where he stands on this stuff, right? We all get it. But Trump is starting to create an administration that is solely designed around guarding him personally and guarding his ego personally, and that's not how things are going to get done. For people who want things to get done, who want him to be a good president, and yes, things have to get done in order for him to be a good president, he's going to need to focus less on defending his own ego and more on promulgating policy that people like. He's doing some good things. I mean, I talked about this last week. The, the regulatory cuts, the fact that there is a 16 to 1 ratio between regulations that are being cut and new ones that are being imposed, that's a really good thing. More of that, more judicial appointments, more cabinet appointments, more tax policy. Right? There are lots of things that Trump could be doing right now, more religious freedom legislation. There's lots of good things that are very important that Trump should be doing right now. They're not getting done because Trump is, is engaged with Trump. And I think the Scaramucci appointment uh, is, is some of that for sure. I'm going to discuss the Scaramucci appointment in just a second, the world's hottest man according to Marshall. But before I get to any of that, I first want to say thanks to our sponsors over at 5-4 Club. So... This is awesome. Looking good does not have to cost you a ton of money. 5-4 Club is revolutionizing the way people shop because the way that it works, they send you each month a curated box of two to three items that are handpicked to match the current season and your style. You go on their website, you kind of pick your style, what you like to look good in. They've been helping men with fashion for over 15 years and they ship to over 100,000 men every month. They know what they're doing. 5-4 Club will help you build your wardrobe one month at a time. Right now, you get $120 worth of clothes for just $60 a month and you can pause or cancel at any time so it's no commitment. You also receive 50% off, up to 50% off items in their online shop and access to exclusive members-only items, free shipping, and size exchanges so you make sure that you get the best clothes that you can. Again, it doesn't cost you a fortune to look good. These are all items that look like name brand products. You just don't have to pay the extra markup for the name brand. Go to 54club.com right now and enter promo code BEN. You have to spell out the number. So it's F-I-V-E-F-O-U-R club.com promo code Ben. When you do that, they will give you 50% off your first month's package plus a free pair of sunglasses. That's a pretty solid deal just for signing up. 54club.com right now. Enter that promo code Ben. 50% off your first package. 54club.com promo code Ben. And again, it's F-I-V-E-F-O-U-R club.com and you use that promo code Ben and that's how you get to look excellent uh, because that's what the ladies actually enjoy apparently. Uh, I've been told this. Uh, okay, so uh, Anthony Scaramucci is the new White House communications director. Sean Spicer is out. That broke very late breaking news on Friday. Uh, and uh, so here are a few things you need to know about Anthony Scaramucci. And this is indicative of where the administration is going to go. Anthony Scaramucci gives lots of money to Democrats. Now, that's not a shock. Trump gave lots of money to Democrats. But until 2010, he maxed out for Obama in 2008. He gave money to a bevy of Democrats. Uh, he is a Wall Street hedge fund manager. He's sort of mini Trump. Like he, he ran a, a capital group called Skybridge Capital. Um, it has underperformed the market, but he's really big in the press and he likes to talk big on TV. Uh, he's known as being a media savant. He's known as the Mooch, which is always a great nickname. Uh, he has described his politics as being socially inclusive and fiscally responsible. So he has tweeted out a lot of things that are very much to the left. He tweeted out in 2012, quote, We, the USA, has 5% of the world's population, but 50% of the world's guns. Enough is enough. It is just common sense. It applies more, it applied more controls. Uh, so he wants more gun control. 
Uh, he's also said uh, that um, he's also said that he is uh, for gay marriage, against the death penalty, and pro-choice. So there's that. He says he favors a plan that provides universal health care, um, but uh, we, but better than Obamacare. He was critical of Trump in 2015. He had to apologize to Trump, actually. Uh, and now he's become a very ardent supporter on Trump. Uh, over and over, he has defended Trump. Uh, so he is, uh, he's a Trump kid, right? I mean, he, that, that's basically his job. His job is to praise Trump and to look like a Wall Street guy while doing it. Um, my own assessment of his hotness is, is that, uh, as Marshall was asking, my own assessment of his hotness is that, uh, as someone online said, he looks like an extra from the Wolf of Wall Street who wouldn't stop badgering Leo DiCaprio for a selfie. Uh, that, that's sort of the feeling that you get from Anthony Scaramucci. Um, he did a good job in his first press conference because he's much smoother than Sean Spicer. He certainly reflects Trump a lot better than Sean Spicer. And he is not afraid to kiss a little Trump ass, uh, that is for sure. So this is, this is an astonishing clip. So this is Scaramucci from the press conference on Friday. And here is Scaramucci praising Trump in terms that would make Kim Jong-un blush. But here's what I tell you about the president. He's the most competitive person I've ever met. Okay, I've seen this guy throw a dead spiral through a tire. I've seen him at Madison Square Garden with a top coat on. He's standing in the key and he's hitting foul shots and swishing them, okay? He sinks three-foot putts. I don't see this guy as a guy that's ever under siege. This is a very, very competitive person. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of incoming that comes into the White House, but the president's a winner. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of winning. Okay. <laughs> you throw that. I've seen this guy. I mean, it's, it does sound like a Kim Jong-un promo. Like, for a while, in North Korea, they were saying that Kim Jong-un held the lowest score ever in golf, that he had scored an 18 in golf, that he had 18 holes in one. Like, this is part of the legend of Kim Jong-un. He's a unicorn lair, and he scores 18 in golf because every hole is a hole in one. Uh, that, that's basically anything. I've seen him throw a spiral right through a tire. I mean, he just goes out there like Brett Favre in his Wrangler jeans in his off days. And, I mean, the man can throw it 70 yards on a dime. Boom, hit the guy right in the hands. It's unbelievable. And when he plays basketball, I mean, he's got a hook that would make Kareem just blush. He's incredible. You see him on the offensive glass pounding those boards? Incredible. Have you ever seen him in baseball? He throws 173 miles an hour, and that's his curve. He's unreal. Okay, it's just like, what? What now? So I, I understand that this is, that basically, every time anybody from the Trump administration is on TV, they're on TV for Trump, right? I mean, that's what they do for a living. It's not about getting out Trump's message, per se. It's more about getting out a message to Trump that you are loyal to Trump. And so now Trump is surrounding himself with lots of loyalists. Now, that said, Scaramucci is much better at his job because apparently he has no shame. I mean, if you can get on TV and say stuff like that with a straight face, good for you, dude. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, he, I do love this, though. Uh, he obviously scorns the press. He obviously dislikes. The, he's willing to, to slap the press a little bit. This was the end of his little presser on Friday. It's unnecessary. Thank you. It blows them a kiss. He blows them a kiss at the very end, which is pretty amazing. So that's, that's pretty incredible. So Scaramucci is in. What this means is that he's going to parrot the worst excesses of Trump. So basically, this Trump administration so far, the concessions that Trump has made to the conservative wing have been pushed out of him, I would say. They're not coming from the heart. I think it's hard to say that the Trump is in his guts, a conservative person. On regulations, I think you don't have to push him very hard because as a business person, he suffered with regulations for his entire career in real estate. But I think that when it comes to things like Obamacare, when it comes to things like Judge Gorsuch, I don't think these are things he cares about particularly much. And so he sort of delegated them out. The people who force him to the right are the ones who are now on the outs with him because every time Trump feels like he's being mobilized for a policy, he feels like he's being used and he doesn't like being used. And so his new shtick is to surround himself with people who agree with him and who are going to pat him on the back. That's not really good for his administration. I'm going to explain what that means in just a second. But for that, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com. For $9.99 a month, you can subscribe. We are not just an audio show. We are a video show. So you can watch it live. Uh, you can see the entire show. You can see my magnificent outfits every day. You can see all of the clips, including that one of Scaramucci, which is just fantastic. You can see all of these. Um, there's going to be some video later you're going to want to see, actually. Uh, so you want to subscribe for that. Plus, you get Andrew Clavin's fantastic show live, and you get his uh, you get his mailbag. Gets to be part of his mailbag. Gets to be part of my mailbag. Uh, Michael Knowles is launching a show. What is it, next week now? So uh, Next Monday. Michael Knowles is launching a show, God Help Us. That's not the name of the show. It's not called God Help Us. But he's launching a show, God Help Us. Marshall is the producer on that show, which explains a lot. And, uh, and, so that, and so you can get that show live as well when you go over to dailywire.com and subscribe. Plus, you get the site ad-free. Or if you just want the annual subscription, uh, which is even better, then you, for $99 a year, you get all of those things. Plus this, incredible, magnificent, 
Leftist Tears Tumblr. It says upon it in silvery letters, Leftist Tears, hot or cold. It is something you will treasure for years to come. Hand down to your children. One day, as I say, they will find it in a cave next to a crying baby doll uh, after the apes have taken over and the Statue of Liberty will be just down the block. In any case, it will last the test of time. It will last beyond you. You'll be dead, but this mug will still be there. So you're going to want this thing. It's just fantastic. You can bequeath it to all of your, all your, uh, all your later children. In any case, uh, get that for $99 a year uh, over at dailywire.com. Or if you just want to listen later, go to iTunes or SoundCloud and subscribe and leave us a review. We always appreciate it. Uh, uh, and uh, we will see you on the other side here. So this morning, President, when I say that Trump is, is looking to make some changes in his administration, there are rumors today that Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, is going to be out by the end of the year. That would be a good thing, because Rex Tillerson sucks as Secretary of State. He was a crappy pick in the beginning. I opposed his pick in the beginning, uh, and so that would be a good move. A bad move, however, would be getting rid of Jeff Sessions. So the fact is that, the, that Jeff Sessions is... Uh, is one of the more conservative members of his administration. There's a reason Tucker Carlson and Ann Coulter are working on uh, on President Trump on this and trying to get him to back off his sessions. But Sessions is a great case in point of what Trump is doing, right? Trump is angry at Sessions, not because he thinks he's doing a bad job. I think Sessions is doing a bad job on asset forfeiture, on civil asset forfeiture, which is this idea that if you are picked up on a crime, the government can just seize your property, which is a crazy, crazy law. But Sessions has ramped that up. That, however, is not why Trump is angry at him. Trump is angry at him because he's not protecting him from the Russia stuff. So he tweeted this morning about four hours ago, quote, so why aren't the committees and investigators and, of course, our beleaguered attorney general looking into crooked Hillary's crimes and Russia relations? Okay, first of all, our beleaguered attorney general is mostly beleaguered by Trump at this point. And this idea that he should be looking into crooked Hillary's crimes and Russia relations um, President Trump is the one who pledged that Sessions would not do that if he was appointed. Plus, Sessions works for him, so he could just call him into the office and say, I want you to investigate this, or I'm going to fire you. But he's basically just trying to, to push Sessions out at this point. He's angry at Sessions, as he said to the New York Times, because Sessions recused himself on the Russia stuff. Sessions is one of the more conservative members of the administration. Sessions is on the out. Bannon, apparently, is on the outs. Reince Priebus, the Republican lackey, who's the chief of staff, he's on the outs. There's talk about Scaramucci basically taking over. Over the weekend, Scaramucci was on one of the weekend shows, and he said that if he finds leakers in the White House, he doesn't just mean in the communications office, anywhere in the White House, I'll fire them. That's the language of the chief of staff. So you've got this career Democrat, Scaramucci, who only in the last seven years started campaigning with like Romney and then Jeb Bush. He is now going to be the chief of staff, I think, is, is the direction this is moving. Um, as I say, a lot of the conservative influences, like Sessions, are going to be out. There was a rumor this morning that Rudy Giuliani would be nominated for the post, another New Yorker. This is going to be the most, most New York administration in human history. I like Rudy Giuliani, but putting Giuliani in is just another person surrounding Trump who is going to not stop Trump from his own excesses. Um, Scaramucci himself clearly is not going to do that. I mean, he was on one of the Sunday shows, and here was Scaramucci uh, saying, I mean, this is just incompetence, actually. This is Scaramucci saying that somebody told him that the Russians didn't hack. And then when pressed, he gives an answer. Somebody said to me yesterday, uh, I won't tell you who, that if the Russians actually hacked this situation and spilled out those, uh, those emails, you would have never seen it. You would have never had any evidence of them, meaning that they're super confident in their deception skills and hacking. My point is, n all of the information isn't on the table yet. But here's what I know about well, the wait, president. Wait, 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 Anthony, let, let Anthony, finish. Anthony, let me finish. Well, you, you're right, making a lot of assertions here. You, I don't know who this anonymous person is that said that if the Russians had actually done it, we, we wouldn't have been able to detect it. But it is how, the, how but about, the unanimous. How about it was the president, Jay? Okay, it's the consensus of the intelligence he community. Me, he called it's me a, from Air Force One, yeah. and he basically said to me, hey, you know, this is, maybe they did it, maybe they didn't do it. I don't insane, insane. Okay, so he starts off that conversation with, I'm not going to tell you who it is. But it's the president. Okay, there's a problem with doing this. Okay, number one, it was an actual Russian talking point. The Russians are now confirming, and so are people in the room, that Putin actually said to Trump, if we had hacked, you wouldn't know about it because they'd be so good at it. And now Scaramucci is saying that Trump is repeating those talking points to Scaramucci. I understand that Trump is frustrated with the Russia stuff. Shut up, dude. It's not worth it, okay? Just pursue your agenda. You've got the Republican Party behind you. That's as much as you're going to have behind you at this point. You struggling like this is not going to be helpful. Scaramucci saying that he's humoring the president when the president says that there was no Russian hacking. Okay, the four top intelligence agencies, the DNI, the FBI, the CIA, uh, all these places, right, say that there was Russian interference 
in the election, not hacking election machines. It's not Russian election hacking, but there was a hack on the DNC perpetrated by the Russian government and disseminated by the Russian government in order to damage our electoral system. Okay, Scaramucci, is, like, how is that helpful? Trump has spent the last m several months battling this rumor that he doesn't actually think this happened, and so he's not taking the Russian threat seriously. And then Scaramucci goes out there and says, well, somebody said this to me. And Tapper goes, well, who? And he goes, Trump. Is this the mark of a brilliant communications strategist? I don't think so. And you see this permeating the communications, the, the communications team is that there are the people who want Trump to say the right thing, and then there are the people who are just going to repeat whatever Trump tells them. So you have, you have Scaramucci coming out and saying that he may not actually support the sanctions bill, and then you had Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying that Trump does support the sanctions bill. You had Scaramucci saying, we talked about pardons. And then you had Jay Sekulow saying, pardons are not on the table, right? I mean, like, they're contradicting each other. Sekulow is his lawyer, so Sekulow is trying to protect him from himself. Here's Sekulow talking about the pardon issue. Uh, in that tweet, stated something that's rather unremarkable, and that is that under the Constitution, under Article 2, Section 2, the president has the authority uh, to pardon. But I want to be clear on this, George. We have not and, ha and continue to not have conversations with the president of the United States regarding pardons. Pardons have not been discussed and pardons are not on the table. With regard to the issue of a, a president pardoning himself, and there's a big academic discussion going on right now, an academic debate. You've got Professor Tribe arguing one point, you've got Professor Turley arguing another point. And it, while it makes for interesting academic discussions, let me tell you what the legal team is not doing. We're not researching the issue because the issue of pardons is not on the table. Okay, so he says, well, the legal team isn't researching it. We're not really looking at it. Here's Scaramucci yesterday. Let's cut through it all, okay? You, let, you and I right here, let's cut Do through it. it all. You're basically saying that that tweet is suggesting that the president is going to pardon himself and every one of his no. family members. I asked what are you, you. What are you suggesting? I'm, I'm no, saying he's not he's not going to do that. No, I'm no, sat in the uh, Anthony, Oval. I am suggesting one thing. The president yeah, tweeted about pardons and I'm asking you, who is he thinking about pardoning? That's all nobody. I'm suggesting. Hey, uh, the, so the why raise it? The, the president's thinking about pardoning nobody because it has been coming up a lot. There's an undercurrent of nonsensical stuff because he has oh, asked he, advisors about it. No, come come on, Jake. He's not allowed that. This is the problem with the whole system. He's the president of the United States. If I turn to one of my staff members at Skybridge, I ask them a question, they run out to the news media and tell everything that I'm thinking about. Is that fair to the president? Okay, so he basically is saying that Trump is talking about pardons. So, again, this is not get your communication strategy in order, guys. And I think that the Trump administration, again, if you want it to be successful, you need him to to hem it in, but that's not what's happening, right? Kellyanne Conway, everybody is now auditioning. It, it is The Apprentice. I mean, it really is. Everyone who's auditioning for a White House job is more interested in pleasing Trump on TV than in actually making sure that he implements policies that are going to make him worthy of re-election. Kellyanne Conway yesterday, he says, you should be super, you should be so happy that he's tweeting. I mean, come on, like, it's great that he's tweeting. Assumes but he days. also right there tweets a lot him. about television. He tweet well, so? Uh, you should be happy about that. You should he be also happy tweets that we a lot have about such television. an engaged... You should be happy that we have such an engaged president. But, you know, 99% of what the president does and says is not on Twitter. It's, it's done in the Oval Office. It's done in his cabinet meet, meetings with different cabinet members. Okay, that's fine, except for the fact that when she says you should be happy, he's so engaged. This is what Trump tweeted this morning. Quote, sleazy Adam Schiff, the totally biased congressman looking into Russia. Okay, so far so good. Spends all of his time on TV pushing the Dem loss excuse. And you're spending all of your time watching him on TV tweeting about it. Like... Why is this useful? This is just not useful. Again, I would like to see some, some victories. Come on, okay, I was promised winning. Let's hear the winning. Where's the winning? Come on, let's do it, okay? And I don't mean winning like he stands there in his top coat and he makes shots from the top of the key. I mean like actual conservative wins that we can put our finger on and say this is why we elected Republicans to high office. And look, not all of that's his fault. Congress isn't doing its job. Congress is incompetent. This is why presidential leadership is necessary. Congress knows that there is no risk to them in avoiding Trump at this point, in just bucking Trump. Trump has to make it risky. Trump has to go out there and make the case for his agenda. And then he has to go out there and say to Congress, if you buck my agenda, there will be consequences. Okay, Obama did this. Even Bush did this. Trump isn't doing that right now. And it's very frustrating because he's letting Congress off the hook. Congress is letting itself off the hook. And Trump is more focused on surrounding himself with people who are going to agree with him. So Kellyanne Conway is spending time talking about Robert Mueller. Again, unless Trump is going to fire Robert Mueller, this is a waste of time. So maybe he will fire Robert Mueller. But if he fires the special counsel, all hell is going to break loose because that special can that will look like a cover up. When you start firing the special counsel before the special counsel even comes up with anything, 
I mean, this is not good. And you can see the White House already paving the way for this. Here's Conway doing this routine. Why doesn't the president just want Mueller to prove that Trump is right, that Russia was a hoax? Why doesn't he just want Mueller to go ahead and confirm that for him? Well, isn't Mr. Mueller and his band of Democratic donors doing that? Aren't they trying to do that? Okay, so she's obviously claiming that Mueller is biased. Again, President Trump considered him for FBI director. Okay, so it's, it's, it, it, this is all, it's a waste. The reason, why does this matter? Why does this matter? Why can't I just be happy? Why can't I just sit here and be happy? The reason I can't be happy is because the Democrats are sitting over here just waiting. Okay, the Democrats don't have to do anything. All they have to do is sit over here and wait for Trump to implode all over himself. And they are waiting in the wings with a policy that is going to be so horrible that it's going to destroy everything that Trump is supposedly trying to build. Okay, so here is Chuck Schumer yesterday talking about what comes next for Obamacare. This is the Senate minority leader who, if he gets lucky, could be the Senate majority leader by 2018 and certainly has a very good shot at it by 2020 if things keep going this way. Here's Chuck Schumer, one of the world's worst leftists, talking about what the Democrats are going to do if they take power again. Then we're going to look at broader things. Single payer is one of them. So that is on uh, the table? Medicare. Well, sure, many things are on the table. Medicare for people above 55 is on the table. A buy-in to Medicare is on the table. Buy-in to Medicaid is on the table. Okay, so they're talking about a full-scale nationalization of the healthcare system, essentially, getting rid of insurance companies altogether, and instead, everybody would just work for the government, basically, and the government would decide what people are paid. This would completely destroy the American healthcare system as we know it, and they are talking about doing this openly now because Trump care has failed, because Trump can't make the case, and I'm sorry, firing off a few tweets and riding around in a fire truck is not going to do it when, you're really, when your real focus is on Mueller and Scaramucci and the TV, and if somebody's on TV praising you in, in terms that are sick of fans, enough for your liking. Okay, please, Mr. President, focus. Please, for the love of the country, for the love of the country, please focus on pressing your agenda. Okay, I didn't vote for you, but you can prove me wrong. You proved me wrong with the election. You can prove me wrong again. Prove that you can do this job. Prove that you are capable of gaining the sort of wins that we were told you would gain. Not cursing at the media. Anybody can do that. Okay, that's not a hard job. Contrary to popular opinion, that's a very easy job. All I'm asking is that you give me some reasons to praise you because I would like to do so. You're my president, okay? You're all of our presidents, even the people who don't like you. Okay, before I get to uh, things I like and things I hate, I first want to say thank you to some new sponsors. So, why do we have states, countries, taxes, wars? When did globalization start? Why does history matter? Wondery has a brand new podcast out from PhD historian Patrick Wyman. It's called Tides of History, uh, and it is really fascinating. I've listened to uh, the first three episodes, I believe, the intro and the first couple episodes. It's really well done, and he takes on some issues in history uh, that haven't really been covered too much. So he takes on the period 1350 to 1650, uh, and he talks about why the roots of the modern world start there. Like, why are there states in the first place? Why aren't we just a bunch of separate fiefdoms? How was it that states became the predominant way of doing business? Why is it that there's free trade? How did these trade routes get started? How did capitalism begin? Where did globalization start? Right? All of the forces that shape our modern world begin in that post-medieval era, uh, just before the, during the Renaissance era and just before, the, just before the Enlightenment. And that's the period that he takes on in Tides of History. Really well-researched, interesting stuff. He makes what could be very dry history, very interesting. Go listen to the first episode of Tides of History by searching for Tides of History on your podcast player or Google Tides of History today. Go to the link on the screen uh, and it is listen. You, know, you can listen, you can learn, you can subscribe. The podcast, again, is called Tides of History uh, and it's really good. You should go check it out at iTunes, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcast, subscribe uh, and give it a listen. Uh, I love history and this is really good history. Even if I disagree with some of it, it's really informative and interesting. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that I like, uh, I've started reading this book, Heavy Reading. Uh, I've been into some, doing some heavy philosophy reading in, in the recent past. Uh, this is a book that was recommended to me actually by, a, by Professor Jordan Peterson uh, over, in, um, over in Canada when I was up there giving a speech. And uh, he was talking about uh, philosophy and the, and the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of God. And he recommended this book, The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America by Louis Menand. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and it is a, a really interesting read, uh, relatively easy read, actually. Um, it's about few, four real thinkers at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who, of course, is Supreme Court Justice. William James, who's the father of modern American psychology. Charles Sanders Peirce, who's been largely forgotten um, but was a logician of, of the first order, uh, and uh, it's it's and John Dewey, uh, who is sort of their intellectual heir and the father of the progressive movement. The reason this is important is because you can see how deeper philosophy 
is siphoned into what the left philosophy is today. John Dewey was the father of, of progressivism in the United States. You can't understand the modern day Barack Obama Democratic Party uh, without reading about John Dewey and his ideological forebears uh, and why it is that the natural law, the natural law philosophy of our founders uh, was cast aside in favor of the legal positivism of people like Oliver Wendell Holmes and the, and the uh, progressivism of John Dewey. So you can check it out, The Metaphysical Club, really good read. Okay, other things that I like, this I thought was just a beautiful video. So there's a stepson who uh, he was adopted, who, um, you know, his, his mother married a stepfather, an 11 year old Tyler from Conyers, Georgia. Uh, he wanted, he, he goes to his stepfather and reads him a letter uh, and asks him officially to become his father via adoption. His stepfather has been in Tyler's life since the boy was 18 months old. Um, and uh, first it was set up as though this was a baby shower. Um, and, then, uh, and, then they start, and then they start taping it. And here is, uh, here's Tyler reading a letter to his stepdad. Took me to my first day of school, brought me, brought my first bike. Taught me how to ride, how to ride a bike. You taught me how to count. You correct me when I was wrong and pick me up when I was down. You gave me more than what I need. I know that we were supposed to be father and son. People even say I look like you. Dad, I have been your child and love since I don't remember, but I want to be your son illegally. Will you please adopt me? That's just awesome. And it does, it does show, you know, honestly, one of the things that's been missing in so many communities, black and white, all over the country now, uh, is the presence of a father figure in people's lives. And that's just beautiful. And it shows you that, that fathers cannot be replaced. Okay, I understand that we're now a society that thinks that, that sexes have no differentiation and that two women is the same as, as a man and a woman or that a mother can do the same thing as a father. You can do both. Not true. Okay, fathers are necessary. I know this from my own children. I know this from my own father. Okay, fathers are necessary. Uh, and and if, if a child is lucky enough to have a wonderful father, uh, there is nothing that can replace that. It's just incredible. So yeah, the, it's just a beautiful video. And it's, it's wonderful that, that uh, they were able to catch that on tape and that we could all experience it because that's just a wonderful thing. Okay, time for some things I hate. So on the flip side... On the flip side of this, of, of this beauty is uh, utter stupidity. So uh, Huffington Post had a tweet yesterday, uh, and it, so they tweeted that this tweet, this picture, will show you that, uh, I, I want to get the exact tweet if I can find it. Uh, they said that this, this, this picture will show you that periods are not just for women. Okay, and this is a picture of a woman who has a butch haircut, and, uh, and you can't really see it, but at the bottom of the photo, uh, she has bled through her pants and said periods are not just for women hashtag bleeding well trans no it turns out periods are just for women okay i'm sorry that you think you're a man but it turns out that you are in fact a biological woman and that is why i cannot have my period today nor can mathis nor i believe can marshall so all of this is just a bunch of nonsense and it's so stupid um, I saw that there's this amazing conversation online. It's just incredible uh, how stupid everyone has become. There's this amazing conversation online with, with some sort of trans advocate uh, where somebody said, okay, so if I'm a dude and I have sex with a, a trans woman, am I, is that a gay sexual act, right? Because a trans woman still has the male parts and says, no, that is straight sex. Only if you were a woman and you had sex with the man with the male parts who thinks he's a woman, would that be lesbian? Okay, then. Alrighty, that's kind of, uh, okay. Uh, the, the, this, this person who put up this picture, Cass Clemmer, posted a picture of herself bleeding from the crotch and, the po and posted a poem and said, y'all know I'm trans and queer, which, and what that means for me all around is something that's neither there nor here. Oh, it's poetry. It's a happy, scary middle ground. So when I talk gender inclusion and I wrote these rhymes to help you see, I'm not trying to bring up something shallow. Periods are honestly pretty traumatic for me. See, my life is very clearly marked, like a red border cut up a nation, a time before and a time beyond, the mark of my first menstruation. Is she now comparing this to, like, the Civil War? A red border cut up the nation? So let me take you back to the details I can still recall of the day I gained my first period. Oh, no! And the day I lost it all, I was 15 and still happy, running around all chest bared and buck, climbing trees, digging holes, and no one gave a single bleep. 
I think I'm, I think I mean I think my ma was worried, so I went and grew out my locks, a sign I was normal, still a girl, and painted a neon sign for my gender box. So the day I got my period, my God, a day so proud, this little Andro effed up kid had been bestowed the straight cis shroud. Okay, I'm sorry that you're mentally ill. I'm I, like really, I, I please seek help. I mean, it, it really is sad and it makes you kind of sick to your stomach, honestly, that somebody is living in this much pain because obviously this person is living in serious pain. You are not a man, and pretending that you are a man is going to bring you nothing but misery. Okay, d believing you're a man, this is something that requires, I don't know that there's a great treatment available, but society pretending that you're a man having a period is not the solution to your problems, nor is it the solution to the problems of many gender-confused kids who are younger than 15 years old. Look, do what you want, okay? It's your life, do what you want, but don't, if you insist that periods are not just for women, you are doing a grave disservice to both women and young boys who, who are believing things that are biologically incorrect. It's just... It's just, come, come on. I mean, the, the idea that this is not an imposition on society, of course it's an imposition on society. As I say, go do what you want. No one really cares. But when you start tweeting out things like periods are not just for women and you're featured at the front page of the Huffington Post, requiring that everyone who agrees with basic biology is somehow forced to agree with your lie that you are a man, that it's just, no, no. Okay, other things that I hate. This is the final thing that I hate. So Richard Dawkins, uh, who is an atheist, um, is a, uh, he has now been banned from Berkeley, California. There was a benefit event for, KF, for a KPFA, which is a listener-funded station in Berkeley, California. Tickets were snapped up ahead of the anti-theist plan talk on August 9th. They canceled the event because it turns out that he said some mean things about Muslims. They're fine with him saying mean things about Christians, but as soon as Richard Dawkins said some mean things about Muslims, it was all over, and KPFA canceled the event. They say they emphatically support serious free speech, but we do not support abusive speech. Uh, he's criticized religion publicly for decades, uh, and he's been no platformed. He says he has, con he has strongly condemned misogyny, homophobia, and violence of Islamism, of which Muslims, particularly Muslim women, are the prime victims. Uh, but he is too conservative for Berkeley, so he must not be allowed at their radio station. He is a far leftist, by the way, Richard Dawkins. He is not even close to a right winger. He's a militant atheist who hates religion and is, I believe, a socialist on politics. So uh, this is so this idea that I mean. You talk about the left eating their own. Okay, I lied. There's one more thing I have to show because it's just, it's an important thing. So Charlie Gard, his parents finally gave up on their uh, appeal to the courts today. The court said that the kid deserved to die, which is just horrifying. Uh, they said that they, they, the kid uh, has a right to die, essentially. Um, and, uh, and so this is his parents. Um, you know, we tried to get him over to the U.S. Uh, I reached out to a few Congress people. We were trying to get him citizenship so we could uh, extradite him from the U.K. Uh, they gave up their appeal because at this point it doesn't matter anymore. He's basically brain dead. Uh, and uh, this is the parents reading, the, uh, reading their announcement. His body, heart and soul may soon be gone, but his spirit will live on for eternity and he will make a difference to people's lives for years to come. We will make sure of that. Okay, so uh, just uh, I hope that they do. I hope that they keep fighting for the right to life uh, and the right for the family to make decisions that the government should not be making. Uh, but this, this notion that death with dignity means that you have to die in a hospital rather than striving to live, it's one of my pet peeves. You know, when people have cancer, you hear very often, oh, he's a fighter, he'll make it. Okay, whether you live from cancer or not has very little to do with whether you're a fighter. I know a lot of fighters who have died of cancer, and I know a lot of people who don't seem like particularly strong people who live through cancer. Uh, this idea that health problems are some sort of indicia of moral character, are stu it's stupid, and it's also, it's also immoral, and it's immoral to suggest that, it, that death with dignity, it's more important that this child, uh, this child die sedated in a hospital rather than the parents doing the best they can to save the child's life, even if you don't appreciate the kid's quality of life. That's not your decision to make. Okay, so we'll be back here tomorrow with all of the latest updates. Uh, I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Yeah. <laughs>